Have you ever sat through disputes with subcontractors about payment and not understood what they were talking about and why it mattered so much? Do you find it confusing to understand how contractors get paid for the works they've completed? Or maybe you just find the whole topic of construction contracts overwhelming and confusing. Well, if you've answered yes to any of these questions, then this course is designed just for you. My name's Tim, and I'm an engineer with lots of experience on the design and construction of major infrastructure projects. I've been building short courses to teach the fundamental construction management skills to engineers and other construction management professionals. The courses are designed to teach the skills that you'll use on your job every day. And so far, we've had over a thousand students enrol in our course. Each course is loaded with hours of content and practice activities to make sure you're equipped with the skills you need to excel at your job. This short video is an extract of our course on construction contract management, where we'll teach you everything you need to know about payment on construction projects. We talk about the importance of payment on construction projects, the different payment mechanisms, and payment claims, as well as going through an, an example claim. If you find this video interesting and useful, check out the link in the below description to our complete Udemy course on construction contract management, where we'll teach you a lot more than just payment. Hi, and welcome to section 2.2, payment. In this section of the course, we're gonna talk about the payment process and how contracts define how payment is made from the principal to the contractor. Payment is the primary contractual obligation of the principal. The principal has to pay the contractor for the work completed. Payment is always a critical issue in construction projects as money is a powerful motivator and once you pay somebody, it's hard to get the money back. In addition, contractors always have cash flow problems. The principal is only required to pay the contractor for works completed. However, the contractor will need to pay labour, plant and machinery progressively, typically weekly or fortnightly. There is often a significant gap in the time between when the contractor pays their bills and the principal pays the contractor. Often the contractor will need to borrow money from the bank to make up for this gap in time at higher interest rates. Therefore, the timely payment for works complete is always a critical issue for contractors. The payment section in contracts intends to clearly define the process by which the principal pays the contractor for the works completed. Payment is a lot more complicated than simply paying for the work, works when they are completed. The contractor will make progressive claims as they are completing their works. So if a contractor is under a contract to build a bridge for $5 million, the principal doesn't just pay the contractor in 10, mon 10 months time when the bridge is fully complete he will pay the contractor progressively as they are completing the works. The contractor will make progress claims while they are completing the works, and the payment section in the contract will define the process through which this is meant to happen. Take, for example, the extract from section 42.1 of AS4000. We can see there a description of how the contractor is meant to make progress claims. It describes how at the time specified in the contract for making progress claims, the contractor is to issue to the superintendent. Remember, the superintendent is like a contract um umpire, a payment claim with supporting evidence of how much money they are owed. The way they are paid will vary depending on the different payment mechanism in the contract. Payment mechanisms are effectively different ways the contractor can get paid. There are a wide variety of different payment mechanisms used in construction contracts and the type used will vary depending on the scope and risk allocation passed on to the contractor and ultimately the form of contract chosen. Fixed cost is one of the most common forms of payment mechanisms. It means that the principal pays the contractor a fixed lump sum to complete a given scope of works. The contractor is paid a fixed fee regardless of the actual cost to complete the works. So if a contractor quotes $2 million to build a bridge, they get paid $2 million regardless of whether the bridge costs $200 million or $200,000. Assuming, of course, that the scope remains the same. Fixed cost contracts result in the greatest risk transfer to the contractor. 
A schedule of rate contract is similar to a fixed cost contract, however the quantity is variable. So a contractor is paid a fixed fee per unit of work complete. The key difference here is that the pr principal retains the risk as to the overall quantum of work. As an example, I'm currently managing a subcontractor that is on a schedule of rates contract to complete conduit and pit installation. We pay them per lineal metre of conduit they install. Say they are paid $100 per lineal metre. If they install 10 metres, they get paid $10,000. And if they install 1,000 metres, they get paid $100,000. As per a fixed fee contract, the amount the contractor gets paid does not depend on the actual cost of the works. A key point to note is that on the schedule of rates contract, the principal usually has to guarantee the contractor a minimum amount of work so that the contractor can make sure their overheads and indirect costs are covered. Unlike fixed fee and schedule of rates contracts, a cost re on cost reimbursable contracts, the contractor is paid the actual cost of completing the works. So in other words, the principal retains the cost risk associated with the works. If the bridge costs $2 million to build, the contractor gets paid $2 million. If the bridge costs $10 million to build, the contractor gets paid $10 million. Target cost contracts are different again. Where there is typically a target cost to complete the works and the principal and contractor share profits and losses. This is called a pain share gain share model. The principal and contractor work together to determine the target cost and then the contractor and principal will share savings and losses. This is the payment mechanism used on alliance type contracts which we will discuss in more de detail later on in the course in section 3. Finally, variations, also known as changes to scope, are typically priced at cost plus. Contracts will typically specify a typical profit margin for variations, say for example 8%, and the contractor will be paid the actual cost plus an 8% margin. The contractor will typically have to provide invoices, day sheets, and labour records to justify these costs. Lots of hybrid payment models also exist. For example, you might have a contract with a lump sum component, schedule of rates component, and cost reimbursable components. The different payment mechanisms will be used to reflect the scope and risk allocation with the contractor. Now we've gone through payment mechanisms, let's go through the process that the contractor actually, that shows how the contractor actually gets paid. As I mentioned bef briefly before, contractors are paid progress progressively during the completion of the project, not just at the end. This is necessary for a contractor to manage cash flow and help both, help both parties have faith in each other. A progress payment is the value of work completed in accordance with the contract. So for example, if a contractor is on a fixed fee of $10 million to construct a bridge and the works are 10% complete, they may claim for 10% of the money i.e. $1 million. Claims are always provided by the contractor to the principal or superintendent. The principal or superintendent will then assess this claim and issue a payment certificate for what they assess the value of the work to be. The calculation will depend on the payment mecha mechanism. So a lump sum item may be calculated on a percentage of complete, while schedule of rates will use quantity of work actually completed. The contractor will need to specify the particulars for var variable situations. For example, whether the contractor can receive payment for goods stored off-site, requirements for cash retention or security. The process for issuing a final payment certificate and any payment terms and requirements. All of this will be defined in the contract. Let's now go through the payment process in a little more detail. The payment process begins with the contractor submitting a claim and supporting documentation. This typically happens monthly by a specific day of the month. The principal and superintendent then need to assess the claim to calculate the true amount due. They do this based on the amount of works completed, as well as any breach of contract that would affect the amount due to, through latent conditions, delays or variations. The principal or superintendent need to respond within a fixed time frame. This is typically a legal obligation to ensure contractors are treated fairly and paid on time. This prevents clients 
who want to bully contractors unfairly withholding payment. If the principal does not respond in time, the contractor will be typically owed payment of the full claim. This will happen monthly until practical completion of the project is achieved. On practical completion of the project, the defects liability period will commence. Part of the security withheld by the principal will be returned at practical completion. At the end of the defects liability period, the contractor will then need to make a final payment claim. This will be the last shot the contractor has to claim under the contract. The principal will also return all the security they are holding for the contractor. Finally, let's finish our section on payment by going through an example of a progress claim. This is an example of a payment claim from an imaginary street lighting subcontractor called Uproad Civil. Uproad Civil have been engaged to complete the civil and electrical works associated with a new street lighting system by us, the head contractor on a major road project. Let's start by looking at the structure of the payment claim. You can see the payment claim is broken down into a couple of different sections. The first section details the payment items and the scope awarded to the contractor at tender. The contract has two separable portions, separable portion A, the street lighting civil works, and separable portion B, the supply and installation of the electrical system. Under each separable portion, there are schedule of rate payment items. So for example, under separable portion A, there are payment items for trench type A, B and C, light pole foundation, electrical pits and distribution board foundations. We next have the unit under which each of these quantities are assessed. So for trenches, these quantities are based on how many metres of trenches installed, while the foundation and pits are for each unit. Next is the contract unit rate price. So for each lineal metre of trench type A, Uproad Civil get paid $450. We also have the total quantity awarded at tender. So at the tender stage, it was assumed that the total quantity of work was 1,200 metres of trench type A, 2,900 metres of trench type B, and 330 metres of trench type C, and so on. In a schedule of rate contract, these quantities are indicative only, and that they're, they're primarily for the calculation of an indicative total contract value that is used for insurance and securities. Based on these quantities, we can see the total contract value for separable portion A and separable portion B is around $4 million. Next, under the green section, we have what was previously claimed and paid to the subcontractor for their December works. So in December, we paid Uproad Civil $238,610. This was because we assessed they had completed 193 metres of trench type A, 256 metres of trench type B, 43 metres of trench type C, 6 light pole foundations and 8 electrical pits, as well as an approved variation of $13,560. Now, looking at the yellow section, we have what Uproad Civil is claiming for in January 2021. Remember, Uproad Civil need to claim for what they believe has been completed in the month. It is then our responsibility as the head contractor to review and assess this claim. Uproad Civil are claiming for the quantities shown, so 490 metres of trench type A, 980 metres of trench type B, and so on. You can see under separable portion B, they have stood 28 light pole foundations, but have completed no other electrical works. They are also claiming two variations, variation B, which they believe is worth $26,700, and variation C, which is worth $4,320. Their total claim comes out as $1,106,020. Under the orange heading, we then have our assessment of this claim. As the head contractor or principal in this relationship, we need to assess this claim for what we believe it is worth. You can see the quantities we have assessed for it under the orange column. While Uproad Civil are claim, claiming for 490 metres of trench type A, we believe they have only completed 380 metres. Same with the distribution board foundations. They are claiming for two and we believe they haven't completed any. The reasons for this dispute is most likely that although they have substantially completed the works, there may be some outstanding defects or works that we believe they need to complete before we can pay them for it. On top of this, we've also assessed the valuation of their variations is different. And so in summary, 
our assessment of their payment claim comes out as only $1,008,820. I've attached a copy of this example claim to the course notes, but it should give you a pretty good indication of how the claims and payment mechanisms work. That brings us to the end of our section on payment. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of how payment mechanisms and claims work on construction projects. Next, we're going to talk about security and retention.